we go back to 6.1. He says, I saw the lamb opened one of the seven seals. Open one of the seven seals. So, again, heaven is open. The door was open to the apostle. We see the living creatures again. We see the 24 presbyters. We see the throne of God, the slain lamb. And now we see the slain lamb opening the scroll, the seals of the scroll. Now the mysteries are being revealed. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as the familiar sound of th thunder, come, erhu, erhu. The four living creatures the liturgical spirits of God participate in the unraveling of this drama, of the execution of God's plan. For all those who say, oh, it doesn't matter. No, only Christ. Don't We don't need to deal with saints and angels and all that's nonsense. Just disregard it all. No, they play a role. And God ordained that they play a role in salvation. And he worked through people and he gave them the, uh, the, 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 the grace and the power to forgive sins and to bind and loose and all of that. All of those poor, deluded Protestants who refused to understand that God ordained the participation of the apostles and the prophets and the, all of the holy ones throughout the ages to be a part of his economy. And he wants to honor them and he wants them to be uh, honored by us, but it falls on deaf ears many times. And the first living creature is similar to a lion. We read elsewhere, 4-7. The roaring of a lion closely resembles the sound of, of thunder that we hear, like thunder, come. And one of the seven seals was opened. It was not just a random seal, but it was the first seal. Just like we say the first of the day of the week of the Sabbath, right? First of the uh, day of the Sabbath. Well, this is the first seal, and the first seal is opened. Uh, and the living creature's voice was like a lion. And of course, it was a six winged angel that we're talking about here. And this is the angelic uh, is being called, uh, this angelic being is, that calls out, Come. To whom is he saying this? Come. Who is he speaking to? Come. Come. He's saying it to the coming horsemen. There's a horseman that's coming. And the first one is this white horse, right? And I saw and behold a white horse. And he was sitting, and he was, and he who was sitting on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. All right. So we see a white horse coming. He says, Come to the white horse, comes, and it has a bow and a crown was given to him. This is a symbol of victory. White crown this is victory this is uh the triumph of uh, of the kingdom uh, this is the gospel right we read elsewhere to the bishop of smyrna you remember he says become faithful in a death and i will give you the crown of life all right so the crown here saint of menio says the white horse on the one hand is a symbol of evangelization as a benevolent action towards men. The gospel. While the crown on their hand hints of the dominion and of the victory. So the one seated on the white horse is the Christian gospel. It has been victorious. It has been preached. The gospel is the horse rider of the white horse. Come, it is the gospel that is coming into the world and being preached to the four corners of the world. St. Andrew says the following, it means the generation of the apostles who stretched out the preaching of the gospel like an arrow against the demons. Isn't that fantastic? Have you, have you ever thought about this? Have you understood and thought about the white horse being the victory over the demons, the victory over the devil, the victory over death, the gospel that has been preached, and the victory of those preaching, the apostles, in their fight against the demons. They were fighting demons. They were just fighting flesh and blood, right? The apostle says that clearly, the opposing powers, so that the gospel could prevail over upon the earth. Here, as we see, we have a beautiful hope-bearing announcement, the gospel. It, it's the dawn of the gospel coming, which is accomplished, accompanied by the grace, grace of God, by the power of Christ's resurrection. And 
it bears fruit. It bears fruit. It gives salvation to the world. In Mark 16, 19 to 20, we read the following. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs and intended to it. This is the, 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 the horse is symbolizing this going out and this preaching. The first victory, they went out and they were conquerors. They were conquerors. And we saw already in the second century, according to St. Irenaeus, that the gospel had been preached to far ends of the world. Germany, Siberia, the East, the South, Egypt, Libya, in the middle uh, of the world, the church had spread everywhere already in the second century. So again, we see the cyclical interpretation because obviously the gospel has not been preached once. It, didn't, it wasn't just preached by the apostles, right? It, can, it was continually preached. So in every generation, there's a continual and a constant preaching until the very end of the world. So when it says that there will be a preaching and then the end, right, a preaching the gospel, it's not just one time or two times or five times. It'll be right up until the end. There will be a constant preaching of the gospel, including our generation, including the next generation, until the very end there will be a preaching of the gospel. Very important. An orthodox Christian preaching of the gospel because the gospel is the good news, and the good news comes through and in the church, not through individuals. Not It's not an ideological message. It's a whole presence of God and life in Christ, which is the church. It's all presupposed. So this is going on continually, and it's not just once and out. Uh, in 6.2, we read, he went on conquering and to conquer. So we see here, the cyclical interpretation, right? It's not just he went out conquering, but and to conquer, and that shows the continuous nature of this. St. John the Evangelist, the apostle, says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, apostolic church's faith, the orthodox faith, is overcomes the world, and he overcomes the world uh, so I'm sorry, who, who, who is it that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. But this belief, brothers and sisters, is not a belief in the sense only of a confession. Yes, he's the, he's the Messiah. The demons tremble and believe. It has to be also a trust. All right, so that's the two kinds of faith. Both kinds are necessary if we're going to talk about faith in the Son of God. If you believe in him, you have to trust him. And that trust means an experience of him. It means living in him, like Apostle Paul did. That doesn't happen outside of the economy of salvation in the body of Christ, in the mysteries. Many things happen. Many people approach Christ. Many people seek to love him. But to put him on and to experience that and to, and to truly come to know him and to trust him, that can't happen simply because we wanted to. It can't happen simply because we heard about him and we expected him. We have to live it in our whole being, right? He came to put, that we might put him on, right? In, in baptism, and chrismation, in the communion. So belief in this sense that Jesus is the son of God, then you are a victor. And in, in, in you, the death the de death and sin is overcome. In you, the kingdom of God reigns. In you, he sits on your throne of your heart. And you also are a victor. So you are a horseman on a white horse when you are a part of this victory in the church and through the church and in Christ. Uh, you are coming out. You are victorious too. It's not some kind of abstract event. This is describing the spiritual reality of what's going on now in the world from the beginning uh, of, the, of the gospel to the end. It has a deeper meaning as well beyond this meaning even deeper and that is we read there he came out being victorious and in order to win and it refers to there's a different interpretation different different deeper meaning here and that is two victories there's two victories the first is the spreading of the gospel which we just talked about but there's a second meaning and that is martyrdom the second kind of victory is the martyrdom of christians those who remained faithful against the, those who were denying the gospel. 
In other words, the retention of the faith. This is what we were talking about. The retention of the faith. The trust in God unto death. This is the second kind of victory that's already been won, that's represented here by the horseman, the white horseman, the crown, is that the church gave its witness unto death and was victorious over the devil and sin and death. St. Andrew says very beautifully the following. The first victory is the return of the Gentiles to God, the preaching of the gospel to the ends of the world, to the church, the return of of all to the household of faith, to the communion of the church. The second is the victory of the martyr who, who is in the church and now goes out and is witness to Christ in the world, and he's martyred, who voluntarily offers his body to tortures, exiting this life victoriously. So it's both and. Both conversion and martyrdom, both are necessary if we're going to be victors.